Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I want to begin by thanking John for leading the song service this morning. I want to thank him for being helpful this morning in, in the various various things that we are doing. Uh, it is it is beneficial, of course. I thank those others who are leading prayers and, and helping and and I'm thankful, brothers and sisters, that you are here, that all of us, that, that we are able to be here and to worship God together and indeed to build one another up, to encourage one another. What a wonderful blessing it is that we can do so. I said last week, and I'll say again this morning, that, that uh, you know, I am glad that we are able to get back together. I know we had a period there where we weren't. But I am thankful that we are able to do so uh, this morning and continue to do so. And, and brothers and sisters, let's remember those who aren't here. Uh, again, we know there are those who are sick and we're mindful of them and we pray for them. And, and we, we think about them and hopefully they will be better and be back with us soon. I would ask you to bow with me as we go to God in prayer. Our Father who art in heaven... We humbly bow before you once again this morning in prayer, and we praise and exalt you. Father, we are so thankful that we are able to come here to worship you. We are thankful, Father, that we are able to praise you, and we pray that, that you will forgive us of any sins that we have in our lives that would hinder our, our praise of you, our worship of you, Father, our prayers to you. Father, we pray that you will find our, our praise acceptable and pleasing, that we will do these things in accordance with your will, that we will do all things in accordance with your will. Father, we are thankful for your word that teaches us about you, teaches us about your will. We pray we will be diligent in our studies, faithful uh, to study your word, but not only to study it, Father, but to apply these things to our lives and to correct ourselves as we need correction. Father, we pray that we may set a good example one for another and for others, that we may teach your word to others, that they may come to know you before it's everlasting too late. We pray these things humbly in Christ's most precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. I read a few moments ago, brothers and sisters, of course, from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. Peter here, of course, addresses, we know as you turn there, we, we know from verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Verse 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Now, you and I weren't there, brothers and sisters, friends. You and I weren't there at the time. And so Peter isn't writing this letter per se to us. He isn't writing this letter down and, and sending it to Robert. He didn't write, Dear Robert, how you doing? But brothers and sisters, just like we read in Jesus' prayer there in John 17, where he prayed for those who would believe, not only for the apostles, but those who would believe on him, on God, based on their word. He was praying ultimately as well for you and for me. And though Peter isn't specifically addressing this letter to us, he is writing to us as well. Because aren't we, in fact, don't we, in, fit, in many ways, now we aren't located in those locations, but are we not the elect? Are we not those who have been, uh, you know, elected, we might say, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, and to obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ? Of course we are. And so too is every other Christian. Now I know, and perhaps we'll, we'll touch on some of this as we go through our lesson this morning, I know, hopefully you know, that there are many in the religious world who will take that text, among others, 
And they'll say, see there, the elect, according to the foreknowledge of God. And therefore you, if you are one of the elect, were foreordained that no matter what you did, you would be saved. We know, and if we don't, we need to know that that is not what Peter here says. Peter is not saying that we are predestinated, there's the term that many people use, that we are predestinated that we will be saved no matter what. It's a misunderstanding of predestination. It's a misunderstanding of the foreordination of God, the foreknowledge of God to say so. We see down in our text here, in, in specifically in verses 15 and 16, and I want to back up just a little bit and read, beginning with verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust, in your ignorance. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Now there's a lot said there. And we're going to look at some of this stuff and, and all, and hopefully we will grow in understanding of what Peter is saying here. But I want us to begin with that phrase that we would that we read in verse 15, but as he which hath called you is holy. He which hath called you, brothers and sisters, the one who has called us. And I want to talk about that calling. There are many people who are running around in this world waiting for God to call them. God hasn't called me. Maybe they're waiting for a phone call. I don't know. You know, I don't mean to make light of someone's thoughts, but, but they're waiting for God some way to mysteriously, to mystically call upon them. But I want us to notice a couple of things about what Peter teaches here when he makes that statement. First of all, let us understand... He who called. And who is that, brothers and sisters? It isn't Robert. It isn't the preacher. It isn't the pastor. It isn't the elders. It isn't someone else. It isn't someone coming magically to, to, to do that. It is God who called us. And we need to understand that. That God is the one who has called us. We see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 14. Whereunto he, he called you by our gospel to the attaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see, brothers and sisters, that he has called us, that it is he, it is God who called us. Now let us ask the question. We, we notice who did the calling. And we've really kind of answered the question as we've gone through this. To whom was the call given? Was it the few that God set out and decided he was going to save? He looked down and he said, you know, Peggy, I like you and, and I, I'm going to save you. And he looked over at Jerry over there sitting next to him and he said, sorry, Jerry, I ain't got nothing for you, buddy. And he went about and he just selected one and then maybe he skipped one or two and then he selected another. Is that what... What Paul here says in, in, in other texts, is that what Paul is saying? That he selected just a few that he chose and those will be saved and all others will be lost. Is that what Peter's saying? Not at all. We need to understand that the Bible is all-inclusive. 
all inclusive and we need to be careful about that because many people of course say that that means that everybody's saved no matter what they do so you got some over here on one side of the argument who are saying that it's only the few that god selected and therefore they're saved no matter what they do they couldn't be lost if they tried and those who he didn't select there can't be saved no matter what they do no matter what effort they put forth no matter how faithful they are to god no matter how much they believe in god no matter how much they trust in god of course, they would make the argument that you can't believe in God unless God selects you anyway. And then on the other side, you got the people who say, well, it doesn't matter what I do, I'm saved no matter what. We're all saved no matter what we do. We can be the most vile, wicked, disobedient people and it doesn't matter. We'll call that the participation trophy, right? We got a situation in the world today where we find that many people, that's what we teach kids participation you get a you get a trophy you get a medal you get a reward for no other reason that you participated you did a good job you were there i'll tell you what brothers and sisters the truth to be told if i was going to be in sports that's about the only way i would get a participate uh, get a trophy is a participation trophy because i probably wouldn't win one but brothers and sisters neither of those things are true God hasn't looked over here and said, well, I'm just going to say the few that I, I like and the, or that I, by whatever measure, I chose, and, and therefore the rest are lost. And he didn't say, you know what, it doesn't matter what you do. I love you so much, I'm going to overlook you. You're going to be okay. But let us understand, when we say that he is, that the Bible is all-inclusive, what we are talking about is what we read in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, among other texts. That God desires for everyone, all of us, to be saved. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. God desires for you to be saved. If you are lost, it isn't because God looked at you and said, I don't like you. It isn't because God looked at you and said, I don't want to save you. It isn't because God just simply ignored you. It's because you chose to be lost. It's because you chose not to be faithful to Him. If I'm lost, it's because of my own sins. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2. My sins separate me from God. And if I am lost, it's because I have sinned, not because of what God did or didn't do. It's kind of like, and I've used this analogy, this illustration before, Brother Bill Burke, many of you will perhaps remember Brother Bill. I know, many, I know some of you will at least. And Brother Bill... He, I remember him preaching a sermon, and he, he, he was talking. I don't remember specifically the, the entirety of the sermon or, or, or what his specific title was, but I do remember the illustration. It stuck to my mind where he talked about the old couple driving, and I've used it before, and, and you know it, but the old couple driving and the wife sitting there over there in the passenger seat and saying, we just don't sit as close as we used to. Of course, the husband who's driving, what was his response? I ain't moved. He's still sitting where he was. He's still driving. He's still sitting right there in that same spot. So if they're not together anymore, it's because she moved over. Well, brothers and sisters, if you and I aren't as close to God as we used to be, it's not because God moved. It's because we did. It's not because God sinned. It's because we did. It's not because God failed, overlooked something, or was insufficient to do what needed to be done. It's because we chose to do what we shouldn't do. God desires, brothers and sisters, for all men, and that is all people, to be saved. He looks at you. He, he looks at you, Marty. He looks at you, Bill. He looks at all of us and he, he says, I want you to be saved. And he says, here's what you need to do. And then it's up to you, Marty. It's up to you, Bill. It's up to me. It's up to all of us to choose for ourselves. Are we going to do that? 
But we talk about that all-inclusive. Look with me. Yes, John, it is one of my favorite texts. But not my very favorite, I don't suppose. But I do love that, and I do, I do get that text in there if I can. I suppose, but in Mark chapter 15, and verse 15 specifically, look at verses 15 to 16, but notice in verse 15, what did he say? Go into what? All the world. He didn't say go over here to part of the world where, where the white folks are. He didn't say don't go over here where, where the other folks are. He didn't say go over here where all the good people are, the wealthy people. He didn't say go to... Go to the nice neighborhood. He said go into all the world and preach the gospel. So we go to people whether they are whatever race they are. We go to people whether they are good, faithful people, you know, good, honest people, or whether they're dishonest and maybe not very pleasant to be around. Whether they're living in the big, nice mansion or whether they're living in the little shack. We go teach the gospel all the world because he desires all men, all the world to be saved. So it is all inclusive, brothers and sisters. John 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved what? The world. He so loved all the world. It is all-inclusive. So that, that invitation, that call, if you will, has been given, and we're about to see that, brothers and sisters, and it's been given by God to all of us. And how does he give that call? Did he ring, did he ring me on the phone? Did he come to me in some dream? We see people who get that in their head. He, he, I had this dream. I've told you before about the... The preacher who said he had preached, or wasn't a preacher, it was, it was, it was a woman in, in, in the congregation, the preacher was telling me about it, and a woman in the congregation that, that uh, wherever this was, that, that um, she had said, you know, talked about, you know, a, a woman not preaching, and she'd never say that again, because why? She'd had a dream about a beautiful woman in a long robe, pretty white robe or whatever it was, dress, you know, and, and she had stood up and said these things, and she was proclaiming and all this, so she'd never say it was wrong for a woman to preach again. Because she's looking for some, something other than where she needs to be looking. And many people are doing that with the call of God. They are looking elsewhere than where it needs to. How does God call us, brothers and sisters? Turn back with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and, and verse 14 and, and notice again we see there that, that it is God who has called us but, but we are told how he calls us where unto he called you what? by our gospel by the gospel of Christ he has called us through the gospel Romans 1 and verse 16 Paul says for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ why? because it is the power of God Unto salvation. It, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation. If you are called, and we all are, the call has been got, sent out to everybody, universal call. It is sent by the gospel. By that foolish preaching of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 21. So we see who called us, we see how he called us, we see who he called us. But many people, as I said, many people are looking for some magical way of doing it. We think about Naaman in 2 Kings in verse, verse five, chapter 5. You remember Naaman? Naaman the leper. And he was, he was apparently a good servant, a good military man, and he, he was well favored and... and the, the king, the head, he decided he wanted to help Naaman. He wanted to help this man, his, his man. And so he, he, there's this little slave girl here, and all, you know, if, if she had said, if there, if there was only, 
if he was only over here in Israel, there's a prophet over there that could heal him. And he was, it was arranged, and he was sent over there, and he goes over to the prophet, and the prophet doesn't even come out and see him. The prophet sends out his servant, says, go over here and dip seven times, and you'll be healed. And what did Naaman do? He jumped over there and ran over there and dipped seven times, right? Nope. He got mad. Because he said, I thought. So often, what do we do? We get in trouble because we start thinking, right? We start overthinking. I'm guilty of that as maybe more than most. But, but we start thinking. Now, religion, Christianity is a thinking religion. Don't get me wrong. We have to do some thinking. We have to reason. We have to understand. But brothers and sisters, we get into the habit of start to thinking how it ought to be. It ought to be this way. God ought to do it this way. God, you know, if you just listen to me, I often joke about how if everybody just listened to me, the world would be a better place. Well, we might get, some people get the attitude, if God had just listened to them, it'd all work out so much better. And Naaman got to thinking. He imagined that the prophet would come out and what? He would clap his hands over him. He would wave his hands over the the, the infected area, and he would heal him through some wonderfully great show, right? Brothers and sisters, there's a lot of Naaman running around today looking for some mystical, magical performance by the preacher, by God, to get them saved. When God has set forth the way for them to do so, by sending his Son... To die on the cross. Read 1 Corinthians 15. And, and specifically looking there in the first four verses about the gospel. You want to know how God call, called us? It's through the gospel. You want to know how he saves us? It's through sending his son and his son dying on that cross to give us the opportunity to be saved. And by our accepting that sacrifice, by our obeying the will of God and living faithfully. No, not to earn our salvation, not to merit it, but to, but because that is what we are to do, and we are just simply servants, right? Isn't that what what we read in in, in God's word? We go back to our text there in First Peter, chapter one. I want us to notice something else, brothers and sisters. Okay, we've been called. Okay, Robert, you got that. I got it. We've been called, and, and, and God has called me, and He called me through the gospel, and now I've obeyed the gospel, and now I'm good to go, right? Now we got to start. But as I've said on numerous occasions, brothers and sisters, we haven't got to finish. Paul, that faithful servant, what did he say? I press. What? He pressed forward, right? He pressed in two. He was reaching out. He was trying to get there. He didn't sit here and say, you know what? I, I've got it made. Think about the tortoise and the hare. I've used that. I used that here recently. The tortoise and the hare. The old, tor the old hare thought he had it made, right? We know the story. He lost. Why? Because he was not doing what he needed to be doing. He was taking his great Abilities for granted, right? He was just faster than the tortoise and he knew it. Got him into some trouble. Brothers and sisters, you and I can't look and say, well, you know, okay, we got it down. We, we, but we've been saved. And we, we're, we're Christians now. We're, we're, we're good to go. And, and there's nothing else to worry about. Because notice in, in our text what Peter says. He, he talks about the calling. He says, but as he which hath called you... Is holy, right? He is holy. So be ye holy in all manner of conversation. The King James Version says, brought my little American Standard Version here, and I know some of you use New King James Version. I'm not sure. Does it use conversation in, in that text? I, I'm not completely certain, but I know the American Standard. Conduct. Conduct. There you go. Conduct. The New King James uses the word conduct. Look at the American Standard Version. 
The Marriage of Sander 1901 says, But like as he who called you is holy, be, your, be ye yourselves also holy in all manner of living. Our conduct, our living, our life. God is holy, and therefore we are to be holy, just as he is, in all manner of life. Uh-oh, right? You mean I got to do so? I got to live as a Christian out there and not just in here? I got to live like a Christian out there on Monday morning and not just here on Sunday morning? Isn't that what Peter's saying there? In all of our lives, be holy. In all matter of, of our conduct, in our living. King James says conversation. We need to watch our speech too. I can't help but think. You, you know, you can probably look it up. I know you can, but you can look it up. The little monkeys, right? The three little monkeys. One of them got his eyes covered. One's got his ears covered. And one's got both hands over his mouth. I know a little monkey standing up here preaching that sometimes probably needs to have four or five hands over his mouth. You know, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, right? We need to watch what we say, what we live. So yes, the King James uses the word conversation and, and it does... It does seem to draw our attention to the way we speak as opposed to just our whole life. But, but in reality, it's, it's not just our speech. It includes our speech. It includes what our conversation is. When I'm sitting there talking to Bill or, 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 or Jim or any of you, I need to watch what I'm saying, right? When I'm out there talking to, to the people I may be around out in the world, I need to watch what I'm saying. I guarantee you they're not always watching what they're saying because they don't care. I need to watch my language, but I need to watch my conduct, my way of living, brothers and sisters. Let us understand the Bible explicitly and plainly states on multiple occasions that God is in fact holy. And in Leviticus chapter 11 and verse 44, Peter is quoting here from from Leviticus 11, verse 44, among other texts, you can read the same ideas presented. In chapter 11, and verse 44 of Leviticus, we read, For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And there's a number of other texts, brothers and sisters. Verse 45 here, chapter 9 and verse 2, chapter 20, verse 7, chapter 20 and verse 20. We see that over and over God makes plain, and He's talking to the children of Israel. He makes plain to them, He is holy, and so He expects His people to be holy. Well, guess who's His people today? Christians. He's holy, and as Peter brings out in in 1 Peter 1, therefore we are to be holy. By the way, the, the Greek word there, and I probably mispronounced it, but hagios. It's talking about moral conduct. Well, now we're going to meddling, talking about morality, right? Because morality doesn't matter. At least many people seem to think that. It doesn't matter about my morals. Well, God says it does. God says it makes a difference. God is holy. He is morally right. God who cannot lie. Oh, but it doesn't hurt to tell a little white lie, does it? Well, God can't lie, and God is holy, and we are to be holy, and we are warned about lying, right? Revelation 21 and verse 8. Read it. See what he says about those who lie. And, and, and I don't mean to pick on just the idea of lying because we can look at any other thing. You know, we go out and we're, we're using profanity. Ah, it doesn't matter, right? I think it's cute. It's, it's fun. How many movies do you... You got your favorite movie, right? We have our favorite movies. We have different movies. And there's little lines. That, they always come up with these good little lines, these catchphrases, right? 
Go ahead, make my day. Live long and prosper, Gary. What do you think about these, right? Made him an offer he couldn't refuse. If you build it, they will come. We think about these phrases, and, 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 and sometimes we get ourselves in trouble because sometimes some of those little phrases, some of those little ways of talk, oh, it's just a figure of speech. Well, God doesn't sit back and say, it's just a figure of speech, what I'm saying. And no, I'm not saying that if I say, repeat Clint Eastwood, that I say, go ahead, make my day, that somehow I've used profanity or I've done something wrong. But brothers and sisters, there are catchphrases, if you will, that in fact are wrong. That will get us into trouble. That will cost us our soul. And yes, our language. Yes, what we're doing, how we're living. These things do matter. He, God, is holy, brothers and sisters. He is morally morally righteous. He is morally correct, we might say. And therefore, you and I are to be morally upstanding people. It, it's a good thing. And sometimes we pat ourselves on the back. We're here, right? We sat here and we listened to the whole lesson of Robert. He, lived, he got out there and preached and he preached for too long anyway. And But we sat there and we listened to him. I wonder how many of us throw our shoulders out or our arm, hurt our arms because we're spending our time patting ourselves on the back. Because I showed up for service. I harp on some about showing up for service, right? I harp on all of you about showing up for service. Brothers and sisters, it's important we're here. But understand, I can be here every day, every time that the door is open, I can still be lost. Because if I'm outside the building living like the devil, I can come inside and pretend all I want. And I'm still a child of the devil. Living like the devil. Being like him. I can't pretend in here and then go live like I want to out there. God isn't just in here, is he? He isn't sitting inside the building. When I walk out the doors, he... I don't see you, Robert. I don't know what you're doing there. I don't hear you. I don't know anything about it. He knows what we're doing. He knows about our lives. And brothers and sisters, we are told by Peter here, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation or living or conduct, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. We claim to be children of God. We claim to be Christians, Christ-like. And yet, are we living like it? Because if we aren't living the Christian life, we can call ourselves all that we want to. And we're still not what we want to. Olivia and I were going back and forth, having a little fun with each other. We were watching a cook, cooking show. I don't even remember the word exactly, but, well, we were talking about crepes as well, but there was another word we got to talking about. But on this cooking show, they were mispronouncing one of these words. I don't care how they pronounce it. I, I got it right. I know what I'm talking about. I'm right. They're not. And I was pointing, and she was saying, well, they said it, and I said, yeah, but there was the one on there that kept calling it crepes. And nobody bothered to point out, the other woman there didn't bother to point it out, that it's crepes. And so we were going back and forth and we were looking up on the phone and of course I was right, because I'm always right, right? Just joking there, yeah, I know. But uh, I'm not always right, let's be clear about that. But I was right about that. But brothers and sisters, we can call things whatever we want to and it isn't going to change what it is. I can call myself a Christian all day long. I know a lot of people that call themselves Christians, but I, I know them well enough and pay attention enough to what they say and how they act to know 
They can call themselves what they want, but they aren't Christians according to what this Word says. And I don't say that to be judgmental. I don't say that to say that I'm always right or that I'm perfect. Because guess what? I can look at my own self. I look at the mirror. I, I told Olivia, I'm sure you noticed, maybe you didn't, I trimmed. And now the face in the mirror looks weird. Because you get used to how you look and you, you trim your beard and you, then you, you, the face looks weird. Same face I've had for 46 years now, but it suddenly looks weird. I can see myself, brothers and sisters, and I'm not always living up to what this says. And I don't get a pass because I'm the preacher. And I don't get a pass because I'm just so cute. I don't get a pass because I'm smart. Maybe I'm not any of those things. But brothers and sisters, we don't get a pass because we just think we're, well, I'm a Christian, so that's okay. The Bible tells us that we are to be holy. God ultimately is telling us He is holy and therefore we are to be holy. <clears throat> Are you holy? Maybe you look at yourself and you say, you know, Robert, I haven't even stepped, I haven't even stepped through the door. I haven't obeyed the gospel. I know I need to. The Bible tells me that I must hear the word, that I must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repent of my sins, confess Him to be the Son of God, and be baptized, immersed in water for the remission of my sin. I know those things. And maybe I, I've, I've gone part of the way. You know, I've heard the Word, and I know what it says, and I do believe Jesus is the Son of God. Maybe, though, I need to repent of my sins. I need to confess Him, and I need to be baptized. You're here, and you need to do any of those. Maybe you need to begin at the very beginning. Or maybe you're somewhere along the path, you just need to finish the, the journey, you might say. Or maybe you're a Christian and you look at your life and you say, you know, I know. I haven't been living the life I need to. I've been living like the world, not like a Christian I want to live. I've been unholy, not holy. If that's the case, the wonderful thing is that God is a loving God and He says, if you're willing to confess your faults, I'm willing to forgive you. Because God desires all to be saved. It's all inclusive and that includes you and me. If you're here this morning and you have need, we encourage, plead with you, come while we stand and while we sing. Sweet are the promises, kindest the word.